Mr. Dave Keller, are you here? There he is. I, I was afraid to turn my camera on too early. I might get sucked into that somehow. So <laughs> <laughs> well, I was remaining safely uh, off camera. Well, uh, Dave Keller, if you don't know who Dave Keller is, he's one of my favorite technicians uh, out there. He is the uh, he's the chief uh, uh, technical strategist for StockCharts.com. Did I just screw that one up? No. You're close enough. Chief market yeah, strategist, chief, but same chief idea. Market strategist and. Chief uh, Kahuna in charge there over at the stockcharts.com and, and really a great technician. Um, and you really help all of us make sense of like the broader markets. And, you know, it's not just that. I, I mean, we can all look at charts. We can all look at charts and go, okay, you know, there's an uptrend, there's a downtrend. We see a little overbought, a little oversold, but you really dig it even deeper below the surface and looking in different market sectors and see what's bubbling, you know, or deflating in certain uh, instances below the surface. So so Dave, I'm going to ask you really quick, how do you read this environment? Because there were so many traders that were targeting new lows, myself included, were targeting new lows in the S&P, you know, trading down towards maybe 32, 33, 3400 before we'd see maybe a seasonal bounce into year end. Have we turned the corner and what are you seeing and how are you reading this market today? So tell you what, can I walk through a couple charts? Do you mind? Absolutely. We so, we, um, we are all looking at charts, uh, and we're 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 gonna enjoy looking at charts, especially over the last hour. So let's do it. So indulge me in one slide. I have one PowerPoint slide, and then it's all charts from here. But I did want to start with this because I I find in this sort of environment when we have some seriously competing narratives, it is super easy to flip what I think is the, the process that most of us, if not all of us, should be using to make decisions. If you think about what you should do with any decision, um, except for an emotional decision like marriage or something like that, if you're talking about something involving your money, you should gather evidence, decide what the weight of the evidence di dictates, and then make the decision. In reality, many of us flip that, unfortunately. We do what's on the bottom. We, we make our decision first. I'm bearish, I'm bullish. I think Netflix is going higher. I think the S&P is going to 2,800, whatever. Then we try to gather evidence to validate what we've already decided. And that is called confirmation bias, which is a classic behavioral trap we fall into, which is you make the decision first, and then you just try to find things that'll make you feel better about the decision you've already made. So as we enter into this period where the trend in stocks has been undeniably lower, save for some particular sectors like energy and others, which are obviously doing you know just fine in this environment. But the average stock has been struggling in 2022. The major benchmark's down 20 to 30%. So the trend has been down. Having said that, we're entering into, as you mentioned, the seasonally strongest part of the year. This is the time, November and December, when stocks tend to do pretty well, particularly in a midterm election year. So this is the time when I think more than ever, don't make your decision before you look at the evidence. So for me, the evidence is very chart oriented because I found that is one of the best ways of understanding what the market has to say about what's happening next. Um, the second way, I'll, and, I, and in some ways, I think this is answering your question, Blake, because I'll, I'll get to I'll get to my conclusion here in the in uh, in the next couple charts. Sounds this good. is a, a visualization that uh, Sam Stovall designed years ago. Sam's the uh, chief strategist at CFRA Research. He was at S and P for years, and he had this really simple visualization, really talking about sector leadership, but really focused on the relationship between the stock market and the economy. And it's totally fun to debate economic conditions. A hundred percent agreed, and it is the, the some of the most fun water cooler discussion you can ever have. But what you have to remember is if you're looking at economic data to predict the stock market, you are completely flipping that around. What you wanna do is look at the stock market as a predictor of the economy, because the stock market is forward-looking. It's talking about what economic conditions are gonna be down the road and what's being priced in with by investors today. Economic data is, is, is rear-facing, rear right? It's looking back at what's happened. So the best thing you can do, if you wanna understand what a recession is gonna be like and how difficult it's gonna be and what sectors are most likely gonna thrive in those environments, you should be looking at the at the equity markets, right? The stock markets are the best predictor of what could happen with the uh, with the economic conditions going forward. Um, seasonally, we're sort of in that part of the year, as you mentioned, which is uh, which is the strongest. This is the SPY going back for the last twenty years, and it's simply the batting average, right? What percent of the time each month? Does the S and P finish higher than it started? Dave, Dave, can I I stop you right here? And I, I'm. I, I want to ask, is 20 years enough? 
The mm. reason why I say that is, you know, 2008 on, I mean, it's, it was QE central and we're, we're in a completely different monetary environment today. And, you know, like today from like 2008 on. So would it, would it make sense to even go back further than that? If you can, the more data you can bring in for something like this, the better. Here's the okay. problem though, right? The, the further you go back, the further you get from QE, the further you get from our, you know, the post-financial crisis, which arguably has been a very different world, but also the further you get away from our current market structure, which is the, the downside of that, right? So if you bring in data back from the 70s, the market's now versus 50 years ago, dramatically different, right? In any yeah. measure, right? So just the simple idea of how we actually track stocks and how we price them is completely different. How stocks are traded are different. So the challenge we have with any sort of financial data is limited observations. So, you know, if you study statistics and then look at what we're trying to do as strategists using data from historical bull and bear market cycles, there haven't been that many of them in the modern financial era. So, you know, I, limited data a lot of times is the best we have, which is why I think of seasonality as a as a tendency, not as a rule. And, and that's kind of the point I wanted to make. If you look at the averages for the last 20 years, this takes us back to sort of after the 2002 market bottom, you know, 80, 79% of the time, November has been a strong month, 74% December has been a strong month. That also means that 20% of the time, 25% of the time, those months have actually been down. So it's not a guarantee that it's going to be strong. This just tells you the tendencies. Now, if you look at just midterm election years, it's even stronger. It's even more consistently positive but it's still just a tendency. So my argument would be looking at seasonal tendencies tells you sort of an overall tailwind that we may have for stocks. However, the most important thing is what the trend is telling us. And I, I would argue the trend so far has been pretty consistently lower. Yeah, um, unfortunately. The, yeah, the, the <laughs> chart I would use probably to most directly answer the question you asked, Blake, which is how do you make sense of the market right now? This is a weekly chart of the S&P. So it might be a little longer time frame than many of us are used to looking at, but indulge me and, and take a step back if you're more short-term oriented and look at what's happening now versus two historical periods I want to highlight. If you look at the last six months, we have the S&P, you know, obviously coming off of an all-time high, hitting uh, support right around the 150-week moving average, which is a long-term moving average, bouncing higher, and then making a new low. This indicator right here is called the PPO, which uh, is very similar to the MACD indicator, a common trend-following device. Um, and basically, you have the uh, PPO going below zero, which says we're in a downtrend. Then you get this little buy signal here where it crosses up above the signal line. And then very quickly, another sell signal, basically saying a bear market rally that then is making a new low. The RSI is doing a bullish momentum divergence, meaning lower lows in price, higher lows in RSI. So the price is weakening, but the momentum, the negative momentum is actually dissipating. Now, compare those conditions with two other periods, and you can see they look almost identical. We had almost the exact same pattern mid-2015 to early 2016. A new all-time high, we make a new, uh, a new swing low, and we undercut it. The momentum gets more uh, negative as we get a buy signal and then a secondary uh, sell signal, and then we have a bullish momentum divergence. Now, that ended really well because that led us into 16, 17, 18, and obviously a pretty dramatic bull market. But the exact same thing also happened in 2008 where we had an all-time high, we made new lows, we saw the PPO go below zero, we saw the buy signal and the secondary sell signal, the RSI bullish momentum divergence. So literally, this period right now looks very similar to just before a big bull market and just before a big bear market, right? I was just going to say, you, you, I knew that you were going to bring in a but, but. <laughs> <laughs> so, but. but here's the thing. So, so the question is, how do you figure out which is which, right? And I think that's uh, that's the most important thing. Look at what did happen in 2016, which did not happen in 2008. And it's basically the recovery soon after, right? After you had the bullish momentum divergence, the momentum got positive. The RSI got above 50, which is sort of this dashed line here, which told you buyers were taking control. This was accelerating us out of the 2016 low. The PPO indicator got back above zero, which tells us we're in a bull market phase. And that told us lights out uh, higher and uh, onward to the upside. The complete opposite happened in 2008. Instead of getting above zero, we remained well below zero. We never got another buy signal from the PPO indicator. The RSI got nowhere uh, up to 50. It just continued to go lower. So I would argue now that we've seen these conditions, the real question is what happens next and whether we validate a new low. And, and what's interesting is that signal happened well before the real pain happened, right? 
that sign that things were getting worse was about six months before the eventual bottom. So plenty of time to get way more defensive if you hadn't had a chance to do so already. Um, so I think there are ways to determine which of these is going to happen. And it's it's that really important place we're at right now, which I think is why we're at a pivotal, pivotal moment here. The seasonal trends would tell you the market's going to be pretty strong. The trend in the stock market has been decidedly negative, right? The S&P is making lower lows and lower highs. So when in doubt, I'm going to want to follow the trend in the market. At this point, I'd have to label it as still lower. All right. And, and you know, I, I'm going to stop you here really quick, Dave. And I, I just want to invite all of our attendees. You're, you're listening to Dave Keller. He's, you know, he puts on a wonderful, wonderful podcast, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, uh, at towards the end. But if you have any questions for Dave, this is the time where you should be asking him because I'm going to be uh, addressing some of those questions towards the end of his presentation. Uh, all right, Dave, go ahead. So I think that's I think that's sort of the general sense of where I'd be at. But having said that, what's interesting is, and this this reminds me of 2001, 2002. I lived in New York at the time. Pretty tough time, obviously, for a lot of reasons. We had just moved into the city, 9-11 happening, very, very difficult. And, and the markets was, were- Your name was DaveKeller.com at that time? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Joking. Yeah, right. Tough time, Probably, right? Tough right? Time, right? I, I was going to say everything, right? Everything at that point was. Um, but what I, I distinctly remember is I would I would take the, the bus or the subway to the stop. I would get off and from the newsstand, I would buy a, a paper copy of Investor's Business Daily. And I'd take it to my office and I'd open it up. And what struck me is in 01, 02, which were obviously down years, 03, 04, which is when the recovery was starting, every day there were plenty of examples of charts that were working just fine. And it was a great learning experience for me in a cyclical bear market and a cyclical bull market soon after. In any market environment, there are always stocks that seem to be working. There are always stocks making new highs with nice breakouts. So if you're an equity investor, the sign of encouragement I would tell you is, despite what you see with the broad market environment, there are opportunities out there. And I'm, I'm showing ConocoPhillips, which, you know, obviously energy has been, you know, by far the best performer. I think the XLEs outperformed 65, 67% year to date, uh, the S versus the S&P. So yeah. there are names that are working and it's not just, it's not just those, it's, uh, you know, like Aspen technology in the technology sector. There are charts that are working okay. You know, Dave, I, I was going to ask you. You know, you're you're one of those people, uh, extremely intelligent. I love list, I love looking at your work because your chart work is, you know, CMT, uh, which happens to be one of our sponsors. Just FYI, um, CMT, CMT Association. But um, you are smart and you understand exactly what is moving the market from a macro standpoint. So when you hear like, you you know, like energy is going to be, energy should really outperform here, or maybe banks should outperform because of, you know, this, that, and the other thing, because of what rates are doing. How does that, how does that, or does it um, uh, bring your focus to certain, uh, certain areas of the market? Do, do you incorporate your thought process to how you feel from a macro or fundamental standpoint? And, and then, transfer it over to the charts to see if it is approaching a level that you should be buying or selling? A hundred percent. And and I think, okay. you know, to be honest with you, as a technical analyst, my answer, of course, is going to be follow the price, right? And it doesn't sure. matter in, in many ways. It doesn't matter what the macro conditions are. And I spent a number of years with, uh, you know, at, at Fidelity, working with people like Peter Lynch, who would tell you, it doesn't matter what the big picture is. There are good companies and good themes and just own good companies, it's going to work. And when he was managing the Magellan Fund of the 1980s, that certainly was a winning strategy. But the market is obviously very different now. But having said that, I feel like the reasons why different stocks and different themes work are usually crystal clear looking backwards, right? They look very clear in the rearview mirror. Looking forward, we like to attribute potential causes as to why you know, interest rates are going to go higher, why gold's going to work or not work, um, why oil prices should go higher or lower. Um, all of that is educated guesswork. In the end of the day, the charts will tell you what's actually happening. It'll tell you what investors are pricing in, what those, however they're anticipating things evolving, that shows you how they're voting with their capital. So having said that, I think part of being a well-rounded analyst or a well-rounded investor in this environment is understanding those big picture themes because it has very much been a macro call 
in 2021 and in 2022. And again, I, I I heard bits and pieces of the of the debate that was going on before we uh, before you and I started, um, and it was it was fascinating, I mean, really thought provoking to hear the the different points that they were making. It just strikes me how different 2021 is versus 2022. And 2020 2021 was essentially a liquidity driven bull market phase, right? And if you're surprised by how bad 2022 has been, you're not recognizing how much of an impact the Fed's liquidity pumped into the system in 2021 was really driving asset prices higher. So that was reflected in the chart of the S&P going up. That was reflected on the minimal drawdowns and, and the buy, the, buy the dips was the strategy in 2021. We never had a pullback more than like three to 5%. That was about it. So it was just sort of buy the dips. In 2022, that's changed. The Fed telegraphed what they were going to do at the end of last year. They they said, we're going to start changing the policy. We're going to start being less accommodative, start being, uh, you know, tightening liquidity. That has happened in 2022. And not surprisingly, rates have gone, you know, dramatically higher. The dollar has been consistently strong and risk assets across the board have been, uh, have been struggling mightily. So, I was interviewed back in January and was asked, what's the chart you should have? What's the one chart you should have to make sense of 2022? Again, looking forward 12 months, which is not easy. And my answer was the 10-year yield, because rates at that point were all the way up to about 170, which seemed like an extreme high level. And we're thinking, how how high could, could they go to two, two and a quarter at the time? That was the sort of the debate we were having. But my thought was, um, you know, the the move in interest rates, if the Fed does what it sounds like they're going to do and interest rates go higher, that tends to have dramatic impact on leadership, right? And when rates are going higher, which is this top series, this is just the 10-year yield, this uh, down here is the ratio of value over growth, right? So if this line is going higher, value stocks are outperforming. If the line is going lower, uh, value is underperforming or growth is outperforming. So you can see it tracks pretty well the shape of the tenure, right? When interest rates are going higher, value stocks like energy and financials and industrials tend to do pretty well. Uh, when, when rates are going lower, um, value stocks tend to underperform or growth stocks tend to do well. So the reason I would argue why the uh, market rebounded so beautifully mid-June through mid-August was because the dollar came off of it, rates came down, and all of a sudden that gives room for growth stocks to reexert themselves and actually uh, look a little bit better. When rates are going higher, the, the stuff we love about growth, which is the prospect of future earnings, is just much less attractive. So higher rates is tougher for growth. And our benchmarks are super growth oriented, right? Our benchmarks are dominated by the FANG stocks, the growth stocks. So if growth is going to struggle, it's going to be really hard for our growth oriented benchmarks to do well. So I think the question you should ask yourself if you're you know, thinking longer term through the end of this year into next year is where do you see this top uh, series going, which is the 10 year go? Do you think it's topped out at 420? I can't imagine that's true based on what I'm hearing from the Fed and the expectations of rates going much higher in 2023 for, for some period of time. That means value most likely outperforms uh, growth, and that means most likely it's tough for our benchmarks to do well. However, there will be opportunities for stocks to do well, as you've seen from energy doing just fine on an absolute basis the first half of this year, and now once again uh, doing just fine now. You know, how do you how do you position your portfolio like and, and we, we we can talk about trading and maybe some swing trading and, and how you approach that. But, you know, for those of us that have longer term investments and you got your, you know, your your 401ks or your self-directed IRAs, how are you how would you position yourself a little bit longer term? So it's a tough question. And I would tell you that the challenge to this market, I think for the challenge for a lot of uh, individual investors has not been that equities have done so poorly. It's that bonds have done so much worse. So yeah. a lot of investors for years have considered the bond portion of their portfolio as a savings account, as a high yield savings account, right? It has X percent a year. It's nice and consistent. So I'm either risk on in stocks or I'm risk off when I go to bonds. This year has been absolutely brutal for that because bonds have actually underperformed stocks year to date. So if you owned, you know, the TLT, you're probably down 20, 25% year to date uh, versus the S&P down 15, 20% over the, the, that same time period. So it's been, it's been really, really tough to find a place to, to go. So what that means is I would argue as an investor, you want to rotate to things that are working, right? Which, which is sort of the, the, the discipline of technical analysis in terms of how I practice it is focusing on trends, right? Where do you see positive trends? And again, I'm not struggling. If I scan through a bunch of stocks, I'm not struggling to find things that are working, that are actually doing okay. 
It's just not in the stuff that had been doing okay up until 2022. It's not in growth areas of the market. It's not in technology. It's in defensive areas of the market, places like consumer staples, which at times in 2022 have done very, very well. Um, it's in um, commodity-oriented parts of the market like energy, uh, materials, industrials. So when you think about the prospect of what the market may be doing if rates continue to go higher, I would argue bonds are probably not going to be a place to be for, for a little while here. So I would be focusing, I would be leaning into cyclical areas of the market that most likely are able to thrive, even if the, the major benchmarks are struggling. No, I know. I know you're looking at uh, you're looking at yields there, but can you can you give us give us a pretty uh, like maybe your overview of some of the broader markets? Let's let's start with like let's start with the bond market because obviously rates yeah, every it's a rates world right now, and it seems like some people would argue that the the market is moving around the dollar, but other people would say no, the market's moving around the bond market. So you know if if let's take a look at bonds, maybe look at gold and and obviously anybody else um, there there's. Somebody had asked uh, really quick, how, do you think 4,200 is even a possibility in the S&P? So maybe we can look at the S&P and then uh, take a look at some other assets that might be coming across the wire here. Yeah, of course. So we can start with bonds. And I, and I would tell you that uh, Martin Pring, who's a, a fantastic longtime analyst, wrote, I mean, some of the formative works that a lot of technical analysts like me, those some of the first books we ever read about the markets were books by John Murphy and Martin Pring. And I met with Martin Pring a couple of weeks ago. He was in town in uh, in Redmond. And we chatted about a number of things. And he made a really good point, which is thinking of the traditional relationship between stocks and bonds. In a recessionary environment, when it feels like everything is going down, which is kind of how I would describe 2022, save the dollar and save some energy. Other than that, it's been pretty much everything down this year. When everything goes down, where do you look that things are starting to get better? You should look at the bond markets. And what's funny to me is in my fidelity years, um, when the markets were challenging, we would not spend our time with the equity analyst talking about equity ideas. We would go to the high yield desk. We'd drive up to the fixed income department in New Hampshire, and we'd say, what are you guys seeing? Because they were super focused on risk, and we all sort of knew, and they pounded the table, that the fixed income markets most likely are going to show some improvement before it will be reflected in equities. So this is a chart of ag, which is a pretty <laughs> liquid uh, bond ETF. Yeah. Blake, you don't have to be a technical analyst to know the trend here, right? I mean, it's pretty no, consistently. No, you don't. Right? Yeah, right. <laughs> so, so my son, Henry, who's six, can tell you this is a pretty well-established downtrend here, right? It goes down into, into the right. And so, you know, my, my thought is, you know, we're spending a lot of time thinking about stocks, at least I am, and a lot of questions on where equities may bottom out. And my answer would be, look at this chart first, because it's most likely you're going to see recovery here first. Um, this chart going down is in line, obviously, with interest rates going higher. As long as interest rates keep pushing higher, really tough for equities to uh, to recover. So while the ag is making a new 52-week low, while the TLT is making a new 52-week low, the chances of a reversal are, are are pretty slim. So this is going down. What would I look for? I'd look for this to to try to make a new low and fail to do so. Right? <laughs> try to try to try to hit the ground and miss. That's what you need to do here. And it's it's not happening yet. We continue to make new lows. So a higher low making some sort of recovery, some indication that the momentum is shifting around, it's still very negative, that would make me encouraged about, uh, you know, bonds starting to recover. And only then, given the fact that I think we're deep in a recessionary environment, can you make any sort of educated guess about stocks starting to recover? Okay, well, that, that that's that's a great great overview. Um, so let's talk about the stock market really quick. So, um, yeah. what do you what do you what do you see in there with the S and P? A lot of people are like, there is no way. And by the way, I, I happen to be in the camp that you know anything above four thousand in the S and P going into year end, I'm going to be selling into, um, based on my personal view. But that that doesn't make me right or wrong. That's just how I'm going to be approaching the market. What are your yeah. thoughts here on the S and P? So I'll give you the I'll give you the long story and then I'll give the, the long term version and the short term version uh, together. Okay. So, um, you know, when I think of the big picture structure in the market, I was I was sharing this chart with uh, my premium members earlier today, and we we're looking at this uh, basically the long term Fibonacci relationships. What Fibonacci retracements are designed to do is help you understand where you may expect support or resistance once a big range has been established. So, for example, March 2020 as a significant low. January 2022 is a significant high. The question is, where do we find potential support on the way down? So the big picture framework I would use is basically consider March 2020 as the beginning of the move, January 2022 as the end of the move, what levels become important between there? And it's these pink lines that you see uh, sort of in the background, 3815, 
represents a 38.2% pullback. That was the, the uh, May low. We undercut that briefly in June. And as we rallied uh, in early October, we sort of tested the lower end of that range, around 3,800 to 3,815. I think that's the real line in the sand for this market. As long as we remain below that, I think you're pretty comfortably calling this a bear market phase. We get above there, then all of a sudden it starts to look a little more like July, August, maybe a little more like March, where it's more of a bear market rally. And you have to start thinking about a line in the sand above there. At what point do you need to get rip roaring bullishly positioned. I would argue we're well below those levels. Yeah, I don't think we're anywhere near where you would want to be chasing anything to the upside. And I think as you as you alluded to, I think we're still very much in a sell the dips instead of buy the rips kind of environment. Having said that, I think if and when we break through 3500, which was the low uh, about a week and a half ago, which was the 50% retracement of this uh, of this range, that would take us to the lower end, which is 3,200. I wouldn't be surprised if that is the eventual low that we're faced with. I don't think we're done going lower. And whether that happens this year and we buck the seasonal trends or we get a seasonal bounce and then a big sell-off in the first quarter of next year, I think that's where we end up eventually getting to. Did did, did you just say the 50% Fibonacci ratio? Yeah. I'm joking. Yeah. I'm joking. I'm jo I, don't, I was wondering if you caught that. I, I that's like one of my bigger pet peeves. Like it is not a Fibonacci. It is not. It is not. But you're you know that's a great point, Dave. You we hit the fifty percent retracement. It is a big level that every person looks at. It doesn't doesn't matter if it's a Fibonacci or not, right? So then in the shorter term, I think we have to talk about some of the more tactical levels. And I, you know, and again, when I'm looking at the market on multiple timeframes, which I would encourage people to do, right? Even if you're a short-term trader, some of these longer-term charts that feel way too long-term, you need to be there at some point because that's where a lot of money is being managed on those big secular themes. So understanding how that impacts order flow and the dynamics of the short-term environment, I would argue, are, are, are pivotal in this sort of year when you potentially have a lot of people rotating between assets. So when I, I look I got, at the daily I, chart of the S&P, I see okay. lower lows and lower highs. And even with the bounce this week, which I think was a noisy move to the upside, we still haven't broken above the previous swing high. So getting above 3,800 is that first level. That's what I call a line in the sand. The, what I call a line in the sand is basically a level. As long as we remain below that, I don't care a ton about what happens in the short term because it's not enough. There's not enough buying power to, uh, you know, to deserve my attention. So I set an alert on stock charts for around 38.10, 38.15. And once that triggers, I say, okay, the market's recovered enough that I need to really start to take this seriously and think about how I may want to play a tactical move to the upside a little further than what we've seen so far. So Dave, having said Dave, that, I think 4,000 is, is the real level where you could see a bear market rally uh, push up to. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. You, okay. Yeah. I noticed you have a 50 day and a 200 day moving average on your chart. I, and that's, that's, those are moving averages that I just keep on my charts and have for, for years. But how, how important are those to you, generally speaking? Really good question. So when you're, when you're talking about moving averages, I would say there are two general approaches that you want to use. The approach I'm using here is I like looking at things that I know a lot of other people are looking at. I think a lot of part of the technical toolkit is a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? If we all key in on 3,200, if the market sells down to 3,200, I think you will see a raging buy, um, you know, um, momentum rise up because so many people have seen that that's a level of potential downside. Um, and we've seen that when the market gets to big round numbers, when the market hits the 200 day moving average, it would be amazing if there was not a reversal. It shouldn't be that amazing that August, you know, reversed right at the 200 day. That I think is very much expected because so many investors, even ones that aren't very technically oriented, they seem to know where the 200 day moving average is. Um, so the 50 and the 200 day are the most commonly used. I find the 50 day, particularly in a bull market phase, often is where pullbacks pull back to. So if you look in 2021, buying every time the S&P hit the 200 day or the 50 day moving average was probably one of the best trading systems of the year because it was just yeah. layering in every time we pulled back. So, you know, can the market regain the 50 day? I think that's an important, an important question if we rally further. Having said that, if you're trying to make a trading system based on moving averages, I would argue you want to use exponential averages, which are more sensitive to market movements and much better at trend following. Let me ask you as far as up now, we, we've never, you and I have never had this conversation. And as a technician, I, I'm interested to hear your, your, uh, your, your, your answer to this. Mm. How, much, uh, how much of automated trading do you incorporate into your trading right now? 
Ooh, really good question. So um, I'm a little unique in that in that answer only because I, I think of my role as a market observer more than anything as a chief market strategist. And I think from my days at Fidelity, where our trading capabilities were so restricted by our compliance department, <laughs> I've gotten comfortable with not touching things as much as possible. So my personal accounts, 90% of those assets are driven by a, a momentum model that I rebalance once a month and I check in on a couple times a month and that's it. And I try desperately to not readjust anything intra-month. And at the last day of the month on the 30th or 31st, I'll, I'll make some rebalances. I'll, I'll shift things around if necessary, but it's really, it's a simple momentum strategy looking at about 30 ETFs and just rebalancing into things that I think are working uh, pretty well in that environment. The other 10% is sort of the go anywhere portion of it. And that's where I tend to take risks and, and tend to, you know, look for things that are potentially reversing. That's where I would be allocating to energy right now or solar stocks when they're breaking higher. Um, some of the healthcare names, biotech, when they're starting to, to move a little bit to the upside. But most of my stuff is actually rules-based and, and super simple at that. Got it. Okay. Um, how about gold? Where do you, where do you see gold or precious metals, or maybe there's some other precious metal that looks even more attractive to you than gold at this point, because gold looks like, uh, you know, looks like we're trying to hold some support. And I guess if the dollar does show a top, maybe gold is going to, you know, deliver us, you know, maybe a double bottom there, a higher low. So how are you reading it? Yeah. So this, and sorry for the super noisy chart here. Um, I tend to treat charts as sort of like an ongoing conversation with the market. So that these are, this is one of the charts I actually use for my own purposes. So they're pretty busy, and I and I, I don't I don't publish these charts because they're a little too busy. But it will show you what I'm thinking with it. You know, with gold, it's interesting. This is the GLD we're looking at here as an as an example, and I'll, I'll point you to this area right here. This is the RSI, which is a simple measure of price momentum. One of the things that uh, that I've learned about RSI over time, and this came from people like Connie Brown and Andrew Cardwell, who really popularized this way of using a uh, momentum indicator, the entire range tends to shift if we're in a bull phase or a bear phase. So when the market is in an uptrend, the entire range of the RSI kind of moves higher. And we rarely get below 40 when we pull back and we tend to get overbought when we have a nice rally. And that's what you saw late 21 to early 22. Earlier in 2021, and really what we're seeing now is the opposite. The entire range has fluctuated lower, and you tend to become oversold when you drop lower. And when you have a little reaction rally, we rarely get above an RSI of 60. So as long as we remain in that range, I'm inclined to think that the long-term trend is still negative. And I would know that that's different when we have a rally and the RSI breaks above uh, 60. That's what you saw there back in November of last year, which told you, all right, things are getting different. The picture of gold is changing. We're starting to get a bit of a reversal in the next six months, obviously uh, stronger than we had seen. We haven't seen that yet with uh, with gold. So potentially a double bottom, which is why it's sort of on my watch list of things to uh, things to be uh, cautious of in the uh, in the coming days and weeks. The GLD and, uh, and, and gold uh, spot as well sort of had a low in September and really retested it beautifully this week. If it holds that, then I think there's a potential to rotate higher. And as you mentioned, the 50-day moving average has been a really good way of tracking this trend as well. I'd be keying in on that 158 level on the GLD to see if it can get it back, back above there. Um, and if it does that on improving momentum, I think there's a chance for gold to do better. Um, but what you hit on, Blake, is key, which is the strong dollar has killed the gold trade in 2022. That would have to be, uh, you know, that would only happen, arguably, if the if the uh, dollar has come off a bit, which it maybe did this week, but I think more to prove there on a on a uh, on a weaker dollar environment. I, I could I, I could argue that the dollar's probably killed pretty much everything I mean it's a, <laughs> you know you, you, Fair there's point. been yeah. so many ways to describe the wrecking ball the, you know the widow maker whatever you want to call the dollar but um are there any other precious metals that you see that that really actually look more attractive than gold I mean I, I think gold's setting up but I love the way you just explained the RSI I, I I'm seeing comments come in right now that people are like wow that's a great way to view uh, relative strength. And, and it's the first time I've seen that. So, yeah, um, platinum is one I would look at. Um, and, and again, I, with commodities in general, challenge charts and, and particularly in the last couple of months, you've seen them uh, deteriorate. But while gold has made a new low, while crude oil has been in a bit of a downtrend, if you look for outliers, look for things that are not making a new low while other things are, platinum arguably starting to do that. 
Um, while gold is sort of you know lower and down here as uh, as platinum was in early September, platinum's actually made a couple higher lows. It's now testing the upper end of the range. It's actually really close to breaking above the 200-day moving average. If you look at the RSI, it's actually right up near that 60 level and potentially breaking out. So this is a little further on. This is what I'd love to see gold look like you know down the road a little bit and then see if it's able to follow through to the upside. So I think you could see a breakout there before you'd see it in some of the other metals for sure. That, that's amazing. Um, you know, speaking of the dollar, we we haven't really looked at it or you haven't looked at it uh, for us. We'd love to see your viewpoints on the dollar um as we as we get towards the uh the end of our uh, our, our time together. So well, I mentioned with the uh, previous chart sort of that idea of where the RSI is and just look at the RSI for the US dollar index. This is the US dollar um you know trade weighted dollar that we're looking at. I'm kind of highlighting this which is every time that the dollar has pulled back a bit it's bottomed out right around an RSI of 40 and it's never really gone below there. Again, as long as that continues, and again, I, I, what's interesting is there's a difference in my opinion. I found this uh, in my time at Fidelity where we spent a lot of time going into each other's office, just debating assets, right? What's gold going to do? What's the dollar going to do? And there's the debate about what could happen, which is what that is, versus the evidence of what actually is happening. And I think this is where charts can be really, really valuable because if you set an alert or set a trend or or some trigger that would tell you when this happens, the dollar is potentially reversing and then it deserves my attention. That's where you can get away from a lot of the guesswork involved in investing and, and trading and focus more on what the evidence of the market is. The dollar's made a lower high so far in October. And I think that's noteworthy. Most months in 2022, the dollar's made a new high for the year. This month is actually the first time that didn't happen in uh, in uh, October uh, because it's undercut a little bit the uh, the high that we saw in September. So that's potentially the exhaustion signal of an uptrend. But what I want to see is some sort of validation, right? Some sort of indication that the dollar is now reversing. That's what we've not had yet. So the RSI is still very much in a bullish range. We're well above the 50-day moving average. So the scenario that would tell me to be thinking about gold and platinum as raging, you know, potential upswings would be the dollar pulls back a little further, probably below 110 on the dollar index would be enough. Um, that would take us below the 50-day moving average. I would make a new swing low, 40. Um, those are the alerts that I've set on the chart to tell me when that happens to say, all right, this is maybe no longer a strong dollar environment, at least in the short term. And I need to think about the prospects of gold and other things that have been so beaten down, get at the very least a nice relief rally to the upside. That's awesome. And and Dave, you know, I, I tell you that probably would coincide with that seasonality chart that you were looking at. And it's 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 um it's really awesome because you look at so many different asset classes and put it all together for us. And um I know uh personally I, I'm a big fan of uh stock charts TV. Can you tell us a little bit about your work there over at Stock Charts and what you guys do on a daily basis? Yeah, thanks so much, Blake, and, and thanks for including me in this event. This was this of was a, a lot of fun. I appreciate it. Um, so, Stock Charts was founded by Chip Anderson, who was a, an early Microsoft engineer. He launched the site in the late 1990s. Literally bought the domain and then tried to figure out how to program the technical indicators he was doing by hand into uh, into a website, and that turned into the the tools that I've been using through the discussion uh, today. So, we focus on three things: tools, education, and commentary. So tools are basically deep technical analysis tools, scanning, uh, you know, looking for different ways of visualizing these markets. And because we're covering a lot of different asset classes, particularly when you're looking at stocks and ETFs, I think you have to have a wary eye on all the other things that are obviously impacting uh, those stock and ETF returns. Um, with uh, education, we have a free part of the website called Chart School, which basically teaches you how to use technical analysis and how to apply some of the techniques that I was uh, discussing today. And then commentary, people like me, John Murphy, Martin Pring, Larry Williams, sharing our insights. Here's what we're seeing. Here's what we're thinking. So I actually just posted an article uh, early this morning called Top 10 Stocks in the Accumulation Phase, where we looked at names. It's a lot of energies. You could probably guess because those are the ones really uh, you know, starting to break out. But other ones, got a technology name or random other uh, sectors uh, reflected, showing that even in a bear market phase, stocks are uh, are able to uh, to show some uh, potential upside. So yeah, stockcharts.com is the place to find uh, everything that we talked about. So who's John Murphy, by the way? I've never even heard that guy. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> John, I'm joking. totally joking. You know, we 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 uh, on on our on our daily face shows. I know you've been a guest. You've been a yeah. guest 
uh, with me on Trader Summit. We've done one-on-one -on -one interviews. We've actually brought some other people from uh, from your 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 world um, over there, and I love I love um, you know accumul accumulation distribution patterns as well. So mm. hearing like Bruce and talk about Wyckoff patterns is is that that's like those are those ones that I, if I find them, I love them. I'm all over them, and I trade them. You know, right, so, right. Dave, Dave, I, I want to say this is the first time you're joining us on our event, and it won't be the last time because, uh, it, and and I, I just ask of you, next time that you do come, if we're having a debate like we did with Peter Schiff and uh, Danny Blanchflower, please jump in. Jump in and just get, <laughs> get your... Get your elbows dirty, you know. All right. Now things, that so. I've gotten involved, I'll be I'll be more aggressive next time. No problem. <laughs> yeah. No. It's it's awesome, Dave. Uh, you, you're you're such a pleasure to listen to the way you break down markets. Um, so everybody, make sure you follow uh, Dave. Your Twitter handle, Dave, uh, offhand yeah. at D Keller CMT. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, we're going to be moving on to our next part of the presentation, and I'll I'll be catching up with you soon before year end. Thanks, Blake. Have a good, great day, you guys. Thanks, Dave.